you, David. Thank you for the organizer to invite me. And I must admit, to, write, to set up a talk on uh, experimental quantum error correction after having had the three really good lectures before is very humbling because they make all these constructions with all these qubits and by kind of writing on their uh, PowerPoint, they put one more qubit here and one qubit and then that interacts with that one. And when you look at the experiments, if we can do this with one or two or three or four qubits, we're incredibly delighted and we thought it's a great, great progress. So all of this to say that the experimental part of quantum error correction is only at the beginning. And we hope that one day we'll be able to go in the same way that classical computer has been doing. In fact, very good from Dave to put the picture of the transistors because you look at the transistors in 1950 where it's this kind of little blob of soldering somewhere and you look at today the complexity of these chips, it's amazing. So this gives me confidence that maybe one day we'll be able to harness the quantum world. So talking about harnessing the quantum world, I assume that most of you know about the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo and we're uh, now and for the next few years looking for the best faculty, postdocs and graduate students and if you want to learn more go at www.iqc.ca or send me an email at laflab at iqc.ca. Okay, it's easy with this audience to convince you for the need of quantum error correction and the accuracy threshold. So I will be very brief on that part. And in fact, some of my comments have already been said by previous speakers. But what I'm gonna focus today on is on two things, elements that we need for error correction. One of them is characterizing noise. So all of error correction assume we have some kind of noise and then let's go and build something which kind of will protect us against this noise. But what is the noise? What is this quantum noise that we have around? Do we really know what it is? How much intuition do we have about it? And what I'm gonna talk about is trying to find a way to characterize it in a way which is useful and with the goal of doing quantum error correction. And then the rest of my talk will go and look at some of the experiments that people have been doing on uh, characterizing con control and what I think is one particular way of doing this is to implement some quantum error correcting codes and kind of go through some of them and see whether they're plus and some of the minus. In fact, some in, in these experiments, people are trying to implement certain things and often it's more interesting to see what are these experiments hiding instead of what they are really showing. A little bit like swimsuits. The important is what not, what, not what they show, but what they hide. So you've seen this from uh, Daniel Lidar this morning. Um, I will just kind of make one more comment on Rolf Landauer's uh, comment about uh, quantum computers. His worry was really about quantum computers being analog devices. And we've known and we've learned that we can do the analog of classical error correction. In fact, I used analog twice here. Well, we can do something like a classical error correction by thinking about the operation as being discrete. But when we go and do the experiments, we don't have anything which is discrete. We turn these fields on and off and on. And at some point, we'll have to understand exactly what is the impact of this. On classical computer, because the gates are very fast and they are very good compared to the noise that comes in, it doesn't matter. But where we are today with quantum computers, we are not in that regime at all. Daniel mentioned uh, the, the work by Bill and Rue. The only experimental uh, thing that I will add to what he said is on, the, on this H bar over KBT, if you go and put T equal 300 degree uh, Celsius, at 300 degree Kelvin, what you get is that the time at which things will decohere is 10 to, 10 to the minus nine seconds. In fact, that's what interested me when I saw that paper because that's just started to do NMR and realized that at room temperature in NMR, things decohere on the order of about one second, which gave confidence that maybe there was something wrong with this argument. And indeed, the discovery error correction tells us that indeed there's a way to get around decohering. Also, I'd like to finish with that quote of Rolf Landauer. And for those of you who knew him, Rolf was very, very critical about anything 
really. And then when you made a compliment to somebody, you knew that, wow, it was always going to come back with kind of something behind to be sure that it was not too, too positive. So he says, unfortunately, we continue to see this contribution to quantum parallelism, which are correct and imaginative in their details. So, wow, that was a real, like, there was real progress there. People had rediscovered something really interesting. But suddenly, as soon as the comma is there, is but do not even mention the need to control tolerances and noise. So. Well, in the last 10 years, in a conference like this, shows that kind of mentality has changed. And he says, in some cases, this literature goes even further and simply describe the quantum mechanical mapping from state to state without specifying apparatus needed to do that. In fact, I would say probably most of the people who kind of do quantum error correction kind of don't go really and see the apparatus and see exactly how they work. They make some assumption and they go there. But my presentation will go in there. So after maybe 10 years, here's ways that we have kind of answered some obvious queries. So I think it's the third or fourth time, maybe, that you've seen the accuracy threshold there this morning. And I'm not going to say it again. Uh, working, work building on the work of Peter Shore and Andrew Steen. But what I want to say here is about the significance of it, and we know that this is in principle tells us that we can control quantum system. And I think it's a lot more profound than only for quantum computation. It really tells us that we can harness the quantum world in a scalable way. Not that people have not tried to, uh, they are not controlling the quantum world before, but they were control, they've been controlling only a small part of it. And what we are trying to do in quantum information processing is control them in a way so that the amount of resources doesn't grow too big as we increase the size of the quantum system we want to do. It also gives us a criteria for scalability. And on this, a few years ago, I went to give lectures in Benasque, and it was on error correction. And I said to people, here's that, the list of many of the blueprints for quantum, computer, quantum computation, quantum information processing device. Tell me which one are scalable. So we go in there, and Trump, people says, oh yeah, we don't know enough about them. To know. So I'll go down and they say, oh yeah, oh yeah, this is scalable. Superconducting cube is, oh yeah, it's scalable. And MR, oh no, this is not scalable. And when I finished, I said, why do you say scalable or not? And then I said, what do you mean by scalable? And what I think the accuracy threshold theorem tells us what is, at least it is a necessary condition for scalability. I think it's probably a sufficient condition for scalability also. On that criteria, none of these devices at present certainly are scalable. But it definitely give us the accuracy threshold, uh, a guide to put things together. So when we think about devices, we think about our making gates. If you have an idea of make them robust, I think it's a way to the future. It also gives us a way to compare different technology and how good they are. And a little bit part of my talk will be related to this. So as Daniel mentioned a little bit earlier on, when we think about fault error and quantum error uh, correction or quantum information processing, we need to have a knowledge of the noise. We need to know what are we fighting for. And I'm going to firefighting against, and I'm going to go and talk a little bit about this in a few minutes. After that, I will talk about uh, how do we do a control, and how do we kind of assess that control. And finally, I'll talk about something which is usually not talk that much about is how do we extract the entropy? When we do error correction, we're just moving kind of noise in some sense from one to place to the other. We put it aside in some qubits, but at some point we'll have to extract it or we'll have to have a huge series of qubits and swapping these things. Uh, in your laptop, there's a fan under and you know, if we use it and the fan starts to work. What is the equivalent of this? And this has always kind of worried me a bit of, in principle, yes, you can move it around, but in practice, how hard it is. Like you need something to be hot and kind of moving it to something that you want to be cold. And I'll show you one experiment related to this that uh, has been done recently. And I'll mention, I'll talk about it. Finally, and there's something about parallel operation. This, I have nothing to say that, except that if you don't have parallel operation, I have no idea how you can implement these ideas. Okay, so characterize noise in quantum systems. So I assume that all of you know what is tomography, how do we characterize states? So the idea is that you prepare always the same state, and then you do a set of different uh, measurements, and from this you can gather what the state is. And there is an analog of tomography for the process, and there you set up a system where you make a uh, different states, 
a kind of a, a set of basis states of uh, your quantum system, and you make a set of kind of measurements which tells us kind of how much of these basis states go through the uh, the, the channel, and then you can derive what is called the the, the, uh, the process or kind of map what are the what is usually called the uh, cross operator. Well, an analog way of looking at a cross operator is to look at what is called a chi matrix. It's just the expansion of this in terms of, let's say, a basis like the Pauli matrices, PKs and PL, and so we can think about this as describing the process in a certain system. So if you look at one qubit, when you kind of think how many parameters that you need, it turns out that you need 12 of them. Three of them are the usual rotation of the block sphere, and nine of them are non-unitary um, kind of pieces of the evolution. And to find that you have indeed 12 of them, you can just think about this uh, uh, basis of initial state, final state, and the matrix which links the two, the sky matrix, is a matrix which is four by four because you have four bases of initial state for a density matrix. And then there is some constraint which comes to normalization that you want to preserve probability every time. So four constraints, and then you get these 12 parameters. If you go and look for n qubit, what you get is number which goes like four to the two n minus against the normalization has to be preserved. But this four to the two n grows very, very fast. The experiments by David Corey a few years ago where he looked at the, the process tomography for uh, for a quantum Fourier transform for three qubits. And it turns out that if you look at this, it's a matrix which is 256 by 256, so it's about 5,000 experiments to be able to measure all these things. And once you get this, well, it is nice to see, but you look at maybe there's a few peaks here and not as the same height as what you want, but it's very, very hard to extract kind of useful information. So how do, can we go and find useful information? And what I want to show is recent progress on thinking about this uh, recently. And although this is a tu tutorial, this has been questioned and has been asked for kind of the last kind of 10 years. And there's been progress recently, and there'll be, sure, some more progress because all the answers have not been answered. All the questions have not been answered. So it turns out that at the end, we're not interested in all of this sky matrix or all the kind of uh, the exact details of the process tomography. What we're interested in, and there I'll put my hat of somebody who wants to do error correction. What I'm interested in is implementing some, implementing some code. So. If I want to implement, let's say, the five-bit code or something like this, or if I want to know should I take the seven-bit code or nine-bit code, I will ask question of what is the probability of zero error? What is the probability of one qubit error? What is the probability of two qubit error? I don't give a damn if it's an X, Y, or Z error. I don't give a damn on which qubit it is because I'm going to encode them. But this is the number I want. If I find that kind of two-bit error are kind of much more kind of uh, happens more, much more than if they would be independent, then I'll go and use a different code. But this is the question, and what we would like to do is find an algorithm to find these numbers in an efficient way. So what we are really thinking about is a coarse graining. So what we want to do is here's a cartoon of all the noise parameters in there. We ask a question like, what is the probability of one qubit error? Means we're thinking about not all these parameters, but a coarse gradient of them. If I ask a different question, are these collective error that are corresponding to another coarse gradient? And these coarse gradient are really kind of an implementation of a symmetry. So ideas like this have been kind of thought about by Paolo some years ago, and there it's in a specific context. So how would we go and ask the question or kind of give an answer, how do we go and find what is the probability of zero, one, two, three qubit errors? So you go and talk to your friends in computer science and they tell you that if you average each qubit over SU2, then you will not have a difference. You, you will get kind of probability of having an X, Y, or Z error to be the same. And if, for example, you started with some Krauss operators, which were x plus i, y, then the off-diagonal terms in this sky matrix will can get average away. So how do we go and evaluate this sum? 
for each qubit, and how do we go and implement these things? And so work by kind of Richard Cleave and colleagues and students showed that evaluating this integral is the equivalent of evaluating the sum, where now, instead of summing over SU2, you sum over the Clifford group, and you can find a isomorphic isomorphisms, which is equivalent to the symplectic group and the poly group. So it turns out that if you go and implement this, what you find is when you implement the poly group, it is equivalent of getting rid of the off-diagonal terms in the chi, chi matrix. And when you implement the symplectic group, it is equivalent of kind of averaging between the x, y, and z error. So once you've done that, then what you get in your chi matrix is kind of blocks where there's no more of diagonal terms, and all x, y, z are all equivalent uh, to each other. And then if you kind of symmetrize over the permutation group, then you get kind of errors on one qubit, or the seven qubit will have the same number, and you can go and implement this. So now let's go to think about the experimental way of doing this. So the idea is that you start with a density matrix, you implement a symmetry, a symmetric group. So you have an operation corresponding with this, one element of the, the Clifford group. Then the noise, the dagger of the element of the Clifford group, and the dagger of this, uh, this uh, symmetric group, the permutation group. And with this, you go and measure what is the probability of certain observable, and they will be able to deduce this probability of one error and two errors, and three errors. So, for example, so if you go back and look at how many of those experiments do I have to do, so I told you in the previous transparency that you have 12 element, four here and three here, multiply by each other, 12 element for the Clifford group. For each qubit, it goes up like 12 to the power n, so that would seems to be scaling up exponentially. But you can show that you can, you just have to go and sample these. You don't have to go and find each of them, and you can use the turn of bound to go and see how many of those do you have to go and sample to get a fair sample of the noise that comes in. To implement the symmetry group, there's a very nice little trick. Instead of starting with a generic density matrix, you can start with a state which is already symmetric, like all the zeros. And then you know now that when you average over this, the only noise that you have are poly operators, x, y, and z, and nothing. So the nothing and the z are not going to do anything. And x and y are going to flip some of these bits. So at the end, if you go and measure only the Hamming uh, weight in here, then this will be symmetric because it will be independent of which qubit has been affected because you only want to know the Hamming weight. And from this, you can deduce and relate it to the probability of 0, 1, and 2, and 3 qubit error. So my presentation is about the experiment. So here is an experiment which does that for 2 qubit. So it turns out that in 2 qubit, it's a little bit harder to prepare these zero states. So you can, instead of preparing the zero state, you can prepare operators Zs and Ones and X and Ys. And so that's slightly easier. And you can show that you have parameters, which we call them Cs, which are related to the probability of zero error. So you have a map between the two. So the only difference is that when we do this, then we have to implement the symmetric group by hand. So we then, three ex you do three sets of experiments, okay, three groups of experiments. One, when you start with Zi, you don't do any permutation. And I'll see why, I'll tell you in a second why these things are there. You implement the, the poly group, the symplectic group, the noise comes in, and then the inverse. And then at the end, you go and measure kind of how much signal you have at the end, and that'll give you a probability of how many errors comes in. Same thing, you start here, but you do implement the permutation, and then same kind over there. And then at the end, you do the same experiments, you start with ZZ, and do the same thing and look at how much signal you have. And by adding those two, you can deduce what is the probability for certain errors. I told you here that you were not, although there were these gates, you were not doing a permutation. One thing you have to do and be very careful is to be sure that all these, that these experiments can compare to each other. So if you don't do a gate here, 
this will take more time and then more errors, for example, from the currents will come in. So you want to be sure that all your experiments are the same length, et cetera, et cetera. So you can compare same thing with same thing. So what kind of result that you get out of this? So we look at two simple cases: one with a two qubit system, one with a three qubit system here in liquid state, here in solid state. And although I have lots of graph here, I will give you example of only two things that we have done. One of them where suppose that you implement by hand an engineer noise, which is of the form of a rotation, a current rotation of the two, qubit, two qubits by an angle of 90 degrees in the block sphere around the Z axis. And so the probability of zero error would be a one quarter, probability of zero error one quarter, of one error one half, and two qubit error would be one quarter. You go do, do the experiments by this averaging and see what do you get. And here's the plot that you have here. So we have the probability here, P0, probability P1 in this way. And you see that you have indeed one quarter, 150, 50. So you, very good determination experimentally to have the error that you have. The second experiments we did is one where we didn't know what was the error model. And so we wanted to see, can we learn anything out of this? So it was in solid state NMR. And you might know in solid state NMR that the difficulty is not to do something, but the difficulty is to do nothing. Because we always have a coupling which is on, and then try to turn off the coupling. You have to do things which Lorenzo mentioned about, uh, this morning, this kind of decoupling and kind of uh, doing this. So there is a sequence called Cori 48, and we did this series. And look through and ideally what we would have liked to see at the end is that the probability of zero error would be one and then zero and zero. And then we quickly realized that indeed this is not what we're getting. And it turned out that the, the coupling that we had was not strong enough. And it turns out that it was, it is very hard by doing full tom either to, we would have to do full tomography or other process to find that indeed this was, we were not doing the unit transformation. So we increase the decoupling uh, power and make them kind of faster and kind of doubling the number of pulses that we do it, and then we approximate it to something which is near. In fact, once we uh, did this, once we have this probability of different errors, it is possible to fine grain the information that you have. Here we had an error rate which was higher than when we thought, and we found that the error was uh, much higher on one of the qubit compared to the other and turn out to be this one. And when you see the geometry, you start to understand. The, car the carbons were the ones we were manipulating, the, the ones in black, and the white ones are hydrogen, which were decoupling and found that this. So that's one thing which is very interesting in here is that we can use these techniques, not only kind of for idea in the future for error correction, but also as a diagnostic of what's happening in our systems. We can also go and look at uh, if the noise is independent or not. And here is very good fit. Although it's important to know that we are averaging the noise. So this is uh, a test which is if it fails, we know that the noise is not independent. But if it succeeds, maybe it just tells us that the average noise is independent, but the noise itself might not be. So um, one test that we are doing at present is to look if the noise is Markovian. And the same thing is happening. That is, it will be a test to know that if it it fails, we know absolutely right that it's not Markovian, but if it succeeds, we know that it's only the average part of the noise. So the next, uh, before I go further on there, I should mention that there is, here the question we've asked is what is the probability of certain errors? There is a technique which is analog to this to know about learning about the generators of certain errors. And uh, Cecilia Lopez has a poster which will mention this, and then you can go and see how this can be done. So it's a way, again, to understand and characterize the noise that we have. Once we have the noise, we might want to go and characterize uh, the gates. And this is some work that has been done by many Knil. And ideally, what we would like is to have a process or a benchmarking way to say, this is the error pair gates that we have. So we can go and see, does that fulfill the the uh, threshold that Daniel has given us earlier on this morning. So 
mentioned process tomography, this is definitely not the way to go and do. Um, we need something which is scalable. We um, would like to apply this to a set of random gates because if you go and do these error pair gate for very specific gates, then there's always a way to optimize certain things. So what we would really like to have is something which is kind of independent of the details of the gates that we are doing or the and algorithms. In fact, what we have right now is a way from kind of the, the work of many and collaborators, a way to characterize single qubits. And here's uh, uh, what the process is about. We have a series of gate, G, and then I should have put index J1, G2, G3, G4. So we have a set of them. And what we will, we will do is do an experiment with one gate, two gates, three gates, four gates, up to 100 gates. And then we intersperse the, these gates with uh, a randomization with the, the Pauli group. And what we want to do there is to avoid to have certain things like, for those of you who know uh, NMR, to have some kind of refo refocusing scheme, which will kind of, kind of give you an artificial idea that errors have not kind of come in. So we intersperse them with kind of polygrade. And then what we do at the end is that because the, the, the gates are part of the Clifford group, the P are the poly matrices, we can always invert all that series of gate by a single gate. So we should come back after that to a single state. And we want to do this in this, this way. And the reason why we end up with all these kind of poly gates is we want to be sure that the state preparation does not affect our estimate of the gate error. And same thing for the measurement. So independently of having good or bad state preparation or good and bad measurement, we can estimate what the gate is. And the whole goal of this is to turn all the gates into some kind of depolarization models, one number which tells us how good these gates are. So, um, Manny Kiel, who apparently did the experiments on the iron trap in collaboration with the, the people uh, of, who were working with Dave Weinland, showed that what they get so the, the number of gates they've used is up to 100 gate. Did this experiment, made a series of them with different power realization and average them. What they get is an error pair gate about four by 10 times to minus three. So that gives you an idea of how good are one qubit gate in the ion trap. And when you have only a single ion in the trap. So this is give you an idea of how good it is. Similar result has been kind of worked on in NMR and we get slightly better uh, gate. It, again, this is a molecule with one qubit and in trying to kind of optimize different things and be sure that kind of these gates are done as good as possible. There's two curves and before somebody tells me that uh, the fidelity is greater than one, this is a problem about the normalization, about setting up the initial state. What is important here is the slope at which it go down. There is two, uh, plots in here. One of them has been by just simple pulses when I wrote the gate G. And the second one at the top is the one where we use these kind of uh, composite pulse to correct for imperfection. And quite often when people have been using this in the past with these composite pulse, people were wondering, the pulse is longer. So you have more decorance that comes in during these pulse. But maybe you correct for something. Here we see definitely that this is slightly better by a factor of two of using these composite pulse in one qubit gate. Now, what would be interesting is to take this and then go put two qubit in your system and ask how good are one qubit gates? Because if you don't have the second qubit, there are things that you might be able to do better. If you have a single qubit, you have to be sure that when you talk to one qubit, you don't talk to the second one. So that gives you an idea of how do we characterize noise? And what I want to do now is to go through characterizing a little bit of the control using ideas of error correction. So I'll give you um, a couple of uh, a couple of uh, uh, encodings that have been used in the past and show you what people have been able to do this. And again, with this very humble way that with a few qubits we can show something that these codes kind of work in certain case and see how much precision we have. So this is work that has been done by Debbie Luang, Ike Chuang, and I think Andrew Childs. Debbie is here, so she must, she must know who's the, the third person in that paper. So there is not an error correcting code, but an error detecting code. So the code is given by here. 
and the error are the errors on either first or the second qubit. So obviously, if you look at these states, then if you have a Z error, we'll go to a, a, a state which is orthogonal to the zero L and to the one L. But if the error is on the first or the second qubit, there we'll kind of lose coherence and we'll won't be able to uh, error correct, but we'll be able to error detect. So if we error detect to be sure that we are still in, in, this, uh, in this code, then definitely we'll gain. And so here's a plot of the conditional information left in that state, conditional on the fact that we are in this subspace. So this is, if we don't do the error detection, this is a simulation of using error detection, and this is the experiment. So what you can see out of this is that, indeed, by doing the, uh, the encoding or decoding, you lose information, but you, uh, once it is encoded and you've taken off this factor, you can see that it's flatter here. It is one of the description of the fact that the error detecting codes work. Oops. So here's another code, the three qubit error correcting code. In fact, when, um, when uh, Daniel this morning was mentioning about the first codes which correct for one error, uh, when you do experiments, you try to find your kind of very small errors or find ways with which you use a smaller number of qubits. And it turns out that in many systems, the phase error correct, phase errors occurs at a much faster time than kind of bit flip errors. And in that case, using the three-bit codes work uh, very well. So the idea is to encode it. And if you encode it, leave the noise, decode. What you can show is if the noise, so I, maybe I should write this, and this is in terms of NMR. So if you take these states, write it in terms of poly operators. In fact, these IZ are twice the poly operators. This is the NMR language. Once you encode it, you see now the, the wave function or the, the state is not factorizable anymore. The noise comes in with different powers and depending on kind of what the operators come in there. And once you decode, what you find is that the terms, the linear terms that comes in from the expansion for small t have the same kind of power in there so that they cancel and the first term that is left is something which goes like t squared instead of t. So this is a demonstration that this code corrects for a one qubit error and then it doesn't correct for two qubit error and this is what you kind of get and go and demonstrate. And so when you go and do an experiment and this is what colleagues and I have done many years ago, we had a molecule with three qubits and then we did this encoding, decoding. We compared on when we apply the error correction and we don't apply the error correction. So if we do errors by hand, engineers the noise on the hydrogen, the carbon, carbon two, or no error at all. The red is when we don't do the error correction. The green is when we do the error correction. And then we let the natural noise instead of doing the error by noise. So we just let, once it's encoded, we leave the system kind of for a longer and longer time. And what we get is, if we don't do the error correction, it decays. And when we do the error correction, it gets flatter. In fact, it, turn, it looks here that kind of we do better at long time, but this is an artifice of having the hydrogen nuclei, which decor is much slower than the other ones, and when you take this kind of average, then it, do, it doesn't throw in there. The real demonstration is the part here, that the curve here is much flatter. So instead of having one minus t, it goes like one minus a very small, smaller part of t, about 10 times smaller, and then a t squared term. I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago about using error correction as a, a diagnostic, diagnostic, and uh, that's what uh, Martin Laforet did a few uh, kind of last year. What he showed is how does the error correcting code fails depending on the error model, and he looked at the three-bit error correcting codes where the phases are either correlated or not correlated. That is, you think about kind of phase com uh, each error is coming e to the i theta z, and this theta is the same for qubit one, two, and three, if they are correlated, then the error correcting code is going to fail faster. If they aren't correlated, the error correcting code is going to fa fa fail at a slightly lower rate. And this is what he wanted to look at, and he could kind of 
check that indeed um, what you get out of the archive code, you could determine kind of the correlation uh, factor of uh, the noise that comes in and by different mean verify that indeed that was the case. Once we do these experiments, it's important also to know that these little diagrams where we put a dot and an X seems to be relatively easy to do or a Toffoli gate which is a two dots and just a little X which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk turns out into some quite kind of complicated gates that comes out. So the Toffoli gate here turns out to be uh, a set of three two-bit gates between the different uh, nuclei and a set of one qubit gates that comes in. So if you look at the kind of the, the circuit at the end, which correspond to the decoding and the error correction, look at something which is a lot more complex to put in and that adds time and complexity for system that we're looking at. Another uh, implementation of the three-bit code has been done by uh, Wineland's group uh, in Boulder, and there they implemented a slightly different version of uh, the code, but which is analog, and they do not have much phase errors on the qubits once it is encoded. So they implemented the noise by hand, a little bit like the first, uh, one of the first cases that I mentioned a little bit earlier, and then decoded and went to look. It turns out that they have difficulty of controlling all the three qubits one by one. So they had difficulty of preparing the initial state. So what we see the plot here is what they call the infidelity instead of fidelity. So if it would be kind of going down, it would be, I would say, fantastic, but it kind of barely goes up. When the initial state is kind of, kind of in the, the, the one state, and as they increase it and they have more of the uh, up state, then you can see that their infill, they start to increase. So it is, the fill day of the, is depending on which states that we have. And then you can go and look at it. And you can see that they have included only kind of about you know, an amplitude of a uh, square root of 0.22 of the state up and down. As they go further, it was harder and harder for them to go and get a universal set of states. Which makes me think of one comment I should have done, is when you get a result for quantum error correction like this, what is the measure that we use? And typically it is some kind of fidelity of the state, or ideally it should be something like the entanglement fidelity or an average fidelity over all possible states. Here's an implementation of the five qubit code. So what you, you should see from this, okay, it's done with a, a molecule called uh, crotonic acid. We're not using these two hydrogen. There's a methyl group of three hydrogen which are identical. Turns out that we can kind of project them in a spin half version of them. So this turns out to be a single qubit and the four carbons which is there. What I would like you to kind of remember out of this is the larger complexity of going from a three-bit code to a five-bit code. So in the three-bit code, the encoding was two control nuts and three kind of a three uh, atom R transformation. And here you can see kind of much more complex encoding. The decoding is the inverse of this. And then the error correction is also a lot more complex. So you can see correcting for the Z errors is here, correcting for the X error and the Y error. So when we did the experiments, you read the one after the other and after the other. So then that becomes quite long. Fortunately, once you arrive at this point, you are just kind of trying to find what the syndrome is. And there, even if this, that part of the state they cohere, the place where the quantum information is not, then it doesn't matter as much. So the syndrome itself kind of has some kind of protection or kind of doesn't matter if it's a or not. In the plot here, what we can see is, uh, what we've done is, this is the state here when there is no error. So we encode, we don't leave an error, and we decode and we look at much signal there is, and there is about kind of 80, 85 percent of the signal which is left, which is kind of due to imperfection of the encoding and decoding. And then what we do is, implementing an error on, let's say, here there's no error, here there's an error, a Z error on the methyl group here, Y error on M, and if you remember very well, or if you know anything about NMR, if your nucleus is coupled to all your qubits, and you can kind of measure this coupling, you'll see a line which corresponds to each of the different qubits, kind of being either up or down. 
So when you do the experiments, one of them you will see one of them kind of a, with a peak which has moved from one place to the other, which tells us what is the syndrome that has occurred. And then from this, then we get the result and we can make a plot of the fidelity. At the end, what we got on average fidelity was about 72% at the end, which is still far, quite far from kind of the result that we need to have to really have an improvement using these codes, but it's a demonstration that we can do something and do implement part of these, these things. Another experiment which I wanted to kind of mention is something on the occurrence for subspace. Lorenza mentioned this a bit earlier. And I found this uh, uh, experiment interesting. There's, it's uh, Daniel Lidar and colleagues in Toronto did this a few years ago. Is they look at uh, a system with four qubits where they could encode against a noise which looks like XX on the first two qubits, XX on the last two qubits, and kind of X on all the qubits, so this is the noise operator. They found a code which protects against that noise, and then they were able to do uh, implementation of a small algorithm, the Grover's algorithm. And so they could look that this algorithm can be implemented while the noise was coming in, and because it was a decorrence free subspace, uh, in principle should correct for all kind of strength of the noise. Now, once you start to look at this, one of the things that happens, and here it was studied by Hodge and collaborators at MIT, is if you start to encode your qubits and you want to do logical gates between these encoded qubits, we know process of how, if you have many qubits, how to go kind of make them fault tolerant. But in practice, the way that we implement these control not be, uh, between one qubit to the other, we have to go to part of the Hilbert space where the qubits are not encoded anymore. And then studying of this, of what is the impact of this, is what is the work of uh, Hodge and collaborators. So when they look at something which was uh, slightly different and kind of, again, using cardonic acid, they made a logical belt state out of two kind of, um, uh, two qubits encoded but which were started kind of in a tensor product, make an Adamar transformation, a control knot, and show kind of how good they were at making this transformation. The last uh, code that I want to mention is something on noiseless subsystem. So we've talked about encoding two qubits, three qubit code, the five qubit code, the uh, noiseless subsystem using kind of four qubits. And there's a slightly more compact uh, system which is noiseless, which is not using subspaces, but subsystem. The work that uh, Lorenza has been explaining. And now here's an encoding of how to do this. So again, easy to do this encoding or to say this operator is invariant against the noise. The detail encoding of how you go and do this, and when you do these, these encoding, errors comes in. What we get at the end of this encoding is if we would not have, we have a qubit left on his own, it would go down with the red line. And then we look at uh, whether, how much information is left once we encode. So you take quite a, a hit by encoding itself. But then it's, the information remains there, independent of what kind of noise that comes in. And here's our example of Y noise, it's, all the noise is collective. You can have Y, X, or Z noise and see that it was consistent, consistent with all the uh, different type of noise that comes in. You can see that in this experiment, the noise was implemented by a gradient field in the system and kind of this is the maximum strength of the gradient field just at the border where we can see these uh, kind of an improvement by do, using the no noiseless subsystem. So it would be great if we can do it with natural noise. In fact, again, it would be nice to redo this experiment, but not look at the fact that it's, it's protecting against the collective noise, but go and look at what happens if you leave it with the natural noise and use this again as a diagnostic to know how much kind of independent noise there is in certain system. So I'm kind of nearly at the end, and I know that everybody starts to be hungry. So what I want to mention in my last two transparencies is how do we go and refresh qubits? So in principle, you think about these qubits gets noisy, you go and measure them, and then you collapse them in a state, 
you look at what state it is, you put them in a fiducial state at the zero and go and do your computation again. In practice, it is very hard to do this in quantum systems that we have. In fact, I don't know of any computation except this one where a little bit of this has been done. So this is, in fact, an element which is used for algorithmic cooling. And the idea of algorithmic cooling is, suppose that you have a set of qubits which are coupled to a bath. Can you kind of compress the entropy or the purity of a set of qubits determined, put the purity in one of them, then the other qubits will become more noisy, exchange them with the, uh, with, with the bath, so the bath brings you some clean qubits, redo the process again, and then do this again and again. This is exactly what you need for error correction. So you think about if you would try to do error correction, at some point you would do some process, you'd have dirty qubits, exchange them to the bath, try to do it again. And so we did this first process a few years ago of kind of trying to boost the polarization of a few qubits that correspond to looking again at this uh, malonic acid I mentioned before with three qubits, one of them coupled to a nitrogen. So the process has been to get rid of the polarization on all the qubits. And then we can decouple all the hydrogen in the sample. And because there's uh, one which is very near or much nearer to the, the, the carbon, this one will have much stronger coupling. By reducing the decoupling strength, we can selectively recouple one carbon to that particular atom, atom the, car the, the carbon which is in the middle. So we can tr transfer information from, uh, or transfer polarization from the hydrogen to the carbon. Once we've done that, we can kind of transfer the polarization of this carbon M to one, the one at the top, the carbon two, while we do this, the hydrogen gets repolarized because it's in the bath. Then we can go and do this kind of transfer again, transfer the polarization to the carbon in the middle, do this a third time, and then do this algorithmic cooling. And then once we've done this, our first step, we realize that we can get up to about 1.4 times the polarization that we started with. If you remember the previous transparency, the best we could do would be 1.5. And then we can go and do this again and again. These quantum bits got dirty, polarization smaller than one. We can go and kind of terminalize them again by using the, the contact with the bath to the hydrogen and then boost them, do this kind of algorithmic cooling again, get to 1.56. And then we do it again and again and again. And if we would have perfect gates, we would be able to get to a polarization which is two but errors in the polarization, errors in the gaze that we do, it tapers off and if we go and do a five and a six and a seven, we left over with 1.7. So this is an example of a place where we do a computation and we're able to extract the entropy like at the kind of qubit level on our system. Definitely not perfect, definitely a very small step towards what we want to do for our correction, but it gives me confidence that this idea of being uh, able to extract the entropy of a quantum system in a controlled way is something which can be done experimentally. So I'd like to finish my presentation by uh, going back to the different things that I've mentioned. The first thing that we, we need to have for doing quantum error correction is a knowledge of the noise. And up to very recently, we did not know how to characterize the noise so that we can see if the assumption of the fault tolerant uh, quantum computing that uh, Daniel mentioned this morning kind of would be satisfied. I think we are starting to understand how to go about that and do this. We need to have very good con quantum control. And I showed in certain code how good control was by looking at how good we were at implementing these things. But again, we're still very far. If we really want to have success at using the five bit quantum error cracking code, the FLT has to be better than 0.99 which is quite away from where we are today. I've shown the ability to extract entropy of quantum system. And then I mentioned again parallel operation where we have these systems, but this is something that it is there or not. So recent experiments have demonstrated that we have some element for quantum error correction, but we don't have 
experiments who pull all of this together, and this is where things become much harder, of course. I think I can only finish by saying it's only the beginning. We are making first steps, and I hope that as there is the second and the third and the fourth international conference on quantum error correction, then we'll be able to demonstrate better and better control on these systems to one day getting to fault tolerance quantum computing. Thank you. So in there, we assume that we can prepare 0, 0, 0, 0. And because you are averaging over the poly group and the simplex group, or the Clifford group, it's equivalent of having started with any state which would be, what, any zeros and ones that you, you would have. So, yeah. So you do error correction and then, yeah. so it depends what you want uh, as a result to implement the code, encoding, decoding, and encoding, recoding a second time. Yeah, I think it is possible. And I don't think that this would take very long. After all, uh, QVC is supposed to be repeated, right? So doing that just once. I think what people have not done is be able to extract the, uh, the information out of the, um, the syndromes, but maybe using five qubit. Suppose you want to do the, the three qubit code. So you use uh, three qubit to start with, you keep the two others fresh, and then when you arrive at the information, you can do this. I, I think there's enough machinery and enough kind of knowledge right now to go and do something like this. So, in some sense, you can use this as an estimate for your gate error. So, in principle, you can reduce that gate error as much as you want. But it is hard. In fact, it is a good idea. Um, so, we're thinking about ways of generalizing this uh, number for one qubit gate to many qubit gates. And it's not obvious how to do this. But maybe implementing a, a generic error correcting code would be an idea of how good you are doing this, or a generic algorithm. And then you can divide the number of gates that you have in there and get this number. But if you look at all the devices today, people give you numbers of how good they are at doing gates. But if you go and look at the algorithm that they have implemented, you always see this hit. And I would say nobody can do things at better than a few percent gate error. And for our correction, you need much better than that.